Hi everyone, it's Balint here and welcome to the second episode of my beginner tutorial series on the SPAT object library for MaxMSP made by Aircom. So now you already have a basic idea about what SPAT is for, how you can browse the SPAT5 overview for all the objects, you've heard about sources, speakers, their positions and about the basic OSC syntax. Now we will start to deepen and use this knowledge as we are going to build our first multi-channel system with SPAT. In this and the following more and more in-depth tutorials, we will familiarize ourselves with increasingly complicated technical concepts and theory, but since this can be a little bit overwhelming when meeting with SPAT for the first time, we will digest it bit by bit in the course of several episodes and at each step we will calmly accept the parts we don't yet understand. We now start with a couple of simple example setups, but after we've covered all the basics, we will move to larger scale real world tasks, such as building a complex 3D soundscape installation or using SPAT for multi-channel fixed media composition. Today, we will create a very simple system with one virtual source and a stereo speaker setup. Then we take a little tour around the interface and set up the distance simulation, covering all the essential steps to get our spatialization system up and running. Let's get back to our vending machine for a minute. In the previous episode we said that we input our source sounds, provide positions for them and for our speakers, and then connect the outputs to our DAC. But imagine yourself in your next life reincarnating as a device like this. What would be your main tasks to accomplish multi-channel spatialization? First of all, you would need to set up your internal system so that the software corresponds exactly to the hardware environment you are working with. You create the necessary amount of inputs and outputs and if necessary make some little adjustments to align your speakers both in phase and color. Then, to cover all possible directions, you need to pen signals between your speakers based on a given concept and its mathematical formula. This can already be sufficient for a lot of things, but what if you also want the impression of depth? If you think about it, sounds never exist without space, and our understanding of oral spatiality relies greatly on observing how the space interacts with sounds. To introduce depth and spatiality, you need to set up a room effect which can simulate how you hear sounds from close and distant objects by mixing in the characteristics of a particular space, i.e. a room, which interacts with these sounds and also calculating how our sounds lose energy as they travel through space. In a nutshell, you covered all possible directions with the panning and all possible distances with the room effect. The only thing you need to do now, my dear reincarnated friend, is to pre-process your input sound sources by determining in which direction and how far they are from your vantage point, how do they radiate sound and what part of that is arriving directly to your ears or by bouncing off from the walls. Thus you can truthfully recreate the three-dimensional behavior of your sounding space. Brain is already aching. Now meet the Swiss Army Knife object which can take care of all these steps at once, spat5.spat tilde. Now let's create a system with it for one source and two speakers. First, create a new empty object box and type spat5.spat tilde at inputs 1, at outputs 2 and hit enter. Notice that we created the object with specifying the number of inputs and outputs. This is something we have to do for a lot of SPAT objects when we create them, so just keep that in mind for the future. We connect our input sound to its inlet and connect its outputs to our DAC via a live gain. We can also include a useful graphical tool by typing bpatcher spat5.monitor. Now we create our user interface with which we are going to control and tweak our soundscape. Let me introduce you to your new best friend, spat5.oper. After creating the object, you just connect it to spat tilde very simply like so. Naturally, it also needs to know how many sources and speakers we've got, so we tell this via a message box. Remember OSC? Let's go over it once more. In the previous episode I said it's a hierarchical address. What do I mean by that? Imagine that you want to create addresses, custom identifiers for words, in books, on a bookshelf. With OSC you can achieve this by for example saying shelf 1, book 3, page 6, word 11. 
declaring a unique address to the 11th word on page 6 in the third book on the top shelf. Notice that we always start our OSC addresses with an initial backslash and go from the bigger objects to the smaller ones, which are part of the ones before them, or in other words, from the top level to the deeper and deeper levels, almost like a file path in a file browser. In this case, we just simply type slash source slash number one, comma, then slash speaker slash number two. Here comes a little trick. Also add the bang message at the end. Why? Banking the OPER causes it to output all its data to the SPAT. So this way, we not only initialize our OPER settings, but also inform SPAT about these. So with all that, let's switch on audio and hit play. We hear our mono source in its default position with the default room effect. Now double click on the OPER to see our graphical user interface. You can see lots of things here, but don't worry, all of these will become your friends later on. We won't cover everything about the OPER today, but you will learn the most important things and the names of the others hopefully can already give you a hint about what they are doing. If you don't immediately understand what a particular knob does, you can just use your ears, tweak it to extreme values and listen to what changes in the result. We will also get back to them together later on. Here is a little viewer window where you can see all your sources and all your speakers and that little fellow represents our listening position and orientation, which most of the time just stays there in the middle facing forward like this guy here. As you can see, all of these are in their default position since we haven't told the oper yet where they are. This circular grid marks whole meter distances from the middle, here is one meter, here is two, three and so on. If you want to move your source, you just click and drag them around and the spatialization engine will take care of everything else. The speakers are not editable here by default, so to move them, you just drop down the viewer settings from this cog and click on the editable button, close the settings and drag around the speakers like previously the sources. But this method is a little bit blunt and if you remember my rant from the previous episode about proper calibration, you might want to consider actually measuring the positions of your speakers in the studio and feed that info to the OPER as we will do that later in the real world examples. On the left side of the window you can see two tabs, S1, which is the tab for our source one, and R1, which is the tab for our first and now only room. On the source tab you have some settings for the perceptual factors, some basic filters, options for the air absorption, distance simulation and room effect, some knobs for the position and orientation, and some mute and solo buttons for the different stages of the room effect. There is also a little locket to lock your current settings. On the room tab, you can define the size of the room as well as its reverberance. You can design the temporal bounds and the distribution of the different stages of the reverb, set up the air absorption and the room's crossover frequencies, further tweak its character and behavior, reset it to default or mute it entirely. Today, we will discover the source presence, the radius and drop, and the distance controls and learn how to set up a satisfying distance simulation. The distance knob controls the distance of our source from the origin point. The source presence controls how close or far our source feels to be at its current distance from us. The radius defines how close it can ever get to us. 
Imagine this as some sort of a safe space which surrounds the listener. If the source would get closer than the radius, for example while it's moving through our safe space, it will instead smoothly slide over our heads, always keeping the distance of the radius. The last one we need is the drop, which defines how much louder our source gets if it's twice as close to us, and how much energy it loses when it's twice as far. For example, if you consider a 6 dB rise as representing double volume, we can say here that if our source is twice as far, it will be half as loud, and if it gets twice as close, it will get twice as loud. You can choose between a linear and a logarithmic drop model, which define the curve of this attenuation law. These four values all affect each other to achieve a proper distance simulation. Here's how you should set them up. First, you set the radius, so the closest distance the source can be from you. Then, you set the drop model and the drop value. Next, you move the source so its distance is equal to the radius. And finally, you set the source presence to the level which should represent your input sound's closest possible feel. You can always test the results with moving the source closer and further and repeating the process with different values. Most often, however, you won't really touch the radius or the drop too much, rather just play with the maximum source presence, so trust me, it's really not that complicated in practice. After successfully setting up the distance simulation, you can now drag around your source and listen to the sounding space you've just created. If you want to play a little bit with the room characteristics, try changing the room size or the reverberance to find a more fitting room to your sound source. Congratulations, you've just set up your first multi-channel spatialization system with SPAT. In our next episode, we will extend our system to include several sources in an 8-channel surround studio setup, discover some useful tricks to help us work either in the multi-channel studio or at home, further deepen our knowledge about panning, discover some other upper features, and also dip our toes into the realm of automation. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one. Cheers!